the Gerontological Society of America Momentum Discussions. Welcome to the Momentum Discussion podcast series, where researchers, educators, and practitioners stimulate dialogue on trends with great momentum to advance gerontology. Welcome to this podcast. My name is Molly Perkins, and I'm one of the co-conveners of the GSA Interest Group on HIV, AIDS, and Older Adults. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Mark Brennan Ng, a senior research scientist at Hunter College's Brookdale Center for Healthy Aging in New York City. Dr. Brennan Ng is a fellow of GSA and a member of the GSA Interest Group on HIV, AIDS, and Older Adults. He is nationally and internationally recognized for his research on HIV and aging and a pioneer in this field. So I'm just delighted to have this conversation today. So Dr. Brennan Ng, I'll begin with a very general question. Can you tell us about how you first became interested in HIV and aging? Uh, Hi, Dr. Perkins. That's an interesting question. Um, It wasn't really what I set out to do as a gerontologist and a researcher. It came about more kind of organically in that um, Stephen Karpiak, who I had worked with on a project on older LGBTQ caregivers, uh, went to work at an organization called ACREA, and a one of my um, doctoral students uh, ended up working with him on that project and then um, staying there and doing this research on older adults with HIV. And and when this person went over there, I was like, really, HIV and aging, that's a thing? Because, um, you know, having coming of, come of age during the HIV ep- epidemic as, as a queer person, um, we really didn't think about aging. We thought about just surviving um, before there was a, a treatment available for it. Uh, so I, I've started to pay more attention to that, and um, then there happened to be an opportunity to to go to Acrea. And after talking to Steve Karpiak, uh, I really understood how the field of HIV and aging was growing, and why it was important, and really uh, not only why it was important as a field into itself, but what we could learn from HIV and aging that could be applied to gerontology more generally. So in this area, what research have you been most proud of conducting? I, I, it's hard for me to single anything out. I, when I got into this in 2007, there wasn't a lot of research around HIV and aging. And I think that everything that I and my collaborators have been able to contribute over the years has been important and in some ways uh, groundbreaking. Uh, we, I, I was fortunate to have the research on older adults with HIV data set that uh, ACREA had put together when I got there. And really one of my goals when I was at ACREA wasn't just to publish my own papers, but to make the data available to other people. So I, I would actually, I, I would say I'm proudest of all the collaborative research um, I've done around HIV and aging and the way that has been a mechanism for younger people uh, who are coming up in the field to do dissertations, do initial projects, and really get started as HIV and aging researchers. I think there would be, if I had to single out two of my own pieces of work, uh, one was a study we did uh, looking at service utilization in older adults with HIV, and that, that was really one of the first papers to look at that issue, and then we had a companion paper to that that looked at outcomes of case management for people with HIV, and and that's something that hadn't really been done. Uh, I think another piece of work, which is something I started early but took a long time to finally disseminate, was the work I did on the different typologies of social networks of older adults with HIV. The early research uh, was looking at people as a group and, and tended to be, I, I would say, paint things with a very broad brush in terms of not having adequate social support and mm-hmm. being very friend-centered and not having caregiving resources. But 
I, I was able to dig a little deeper and find some heterogeneity in the social networks of people with HIV. And indeed, there's a group, about a third of the sample I was looking at, who were doing quite well. And there was another group, about a third, who had these friend-centered social networks that we've uh, had identified a lot earlier that were very common to older gay, lesbian, and bisexual adults. Uh, but we did find that there were a third of this group who were very, very socially isolated. And I, I think this work maybe hopefully has helped us to identify this group who's probably going to be in the most need of caregiving and other kinds of uh, social care supports as they grow older. Can you talk a little bit about your research in terms of what we're seeing now with the COVID-19 virus? Um, what would you want people to know about older adults with HIV from your practice research during this challenging time? I, I think the most important thing, and it's not just in my research, but there's been a lot of other people who have been looking into this, is the resilience that we've seen in people with HIV as they've grown older. Uh, I think this has been really key to understanding this population. A, lo a lot of the research and a lot of the work, and, and certainly you know, my own work includes this, really focuses on a lot of the problems and deficits. And there's a reason for that in that we need to have the data, we need to have the evidence base to, to move policy and programs in the directions that are going to be helpful to people. But there's something I think we need to recognize in older people with HIV, and particularly long-term survivors, uh, which is a, a group who's been living with HIV before there was a treatment, in that there's something about them that has allowed them to cope and survive in the face of what at the time was an incurable and quickly terminal illness, and mm -hmm. somehow um, managed to, to deal with all these things. And it's not that there weren't... Um, some scars and wounds along the way. But I, I think one of the things we can learn from, from people is that even faced with a serious illness um, whose outcome and course can be unpredictable, even today with modern ret antiretroviral treatments, there's, there's this core of, of resilience and optimism and hope that's important, but but also one thing that we see with older people with HIV is um, I would call it a kind of self-actualization in that they've learned that they need to be responsible for, for their own health and their own well-being, and many of them are very proactive about that. And I think that's a lesson that carries over well to the, to the current COVID pandemic in that we're all very isolated right now due to the social mitigation efforts. So more than ever, we need to rely on ourselves and our personal resources for getting through this and, and getting to the other side. Yeah, in a, in a recent New York Times article that cited you, you used the term crisis competence to talk about this as one surprise of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, so that was that was a term that was coined by Doug Kimmel in 1978 when he, he did a pretty seminal chapter looking at LGBTQ aging. And he was discussing the paradox of why in the face of a lot of obstacles and discriminations, and you know, if you can kind of dial back to where we were on sexual orientation back in 1978, in, in the context of all of that, we were seeing that older queer people were aging quite successfully and doing quite well. And so there was a real paradox there between the stress and the discrimination that was experienced and the well-being outcome. So uh, Dr. Kimmel came up with this idea of crisis competence that basically going through challenges, challenging experiences in our lives gives us the, the resources and confidence to deal with new challenging experiences as they come our way. Um, and I, that has a lot of resonance. It's, it's been applied in gerontology before, uh, but I was reading the reader response to that article, and a lot of those readers were talking about really their own crisis competence and this idea that I can handle the 
the current situation, but also the experience of knowing at some point things are going to change and that this is temporary and we're going to come out on the other side of it. Uh, so I, th I think, you know, that's something, it doesn't just apply to the oldest old, uh, as was in that article, or to people who are marginalized. I think it really applies to everybody and, uh, you know, how we really grow and adapt over the life course. And I would say that this focus on resilience is important for addressing stigma. I mean, showing the strength that people have who are, you know, confronting challenges, you know, not just HIV, but any challenge. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say that stigma is still such a big issue for people with HIV, including older people. Um, I don't, I don't think people who work outside of HIV really understand that. Uh, a lot of people, uh, when they find out the kind of work they I do, say, "Oh, HIV, it's it's no big deal." But when I I talk to people who are living with HIV, growing older with HIV, they're constantly experiencing stigmatizing experiences around HIV or around other identities that they have. And they wouldn't be able to cope with this without resilience. Um, a great example of this with, without getting too political, but in the 2016 presidential election, uh, the day afterwards, I was doing a focus group of older transgender people with HIV in San Francisco, and things were pretty much in an uproar, and I was really kind of nervous about how the focus group would go, given the historical context of it. And w when I went in to do the focus group, uh, I, I, you know, I thought we need to address the 800 pound grill in the room. And I said, you know, we just had this election is, you know, are we still going to be able to do this focus group today? And kind of the, the opinion was unanimous of we've been through so much in our lives as transgender people, as people with HIV that, you know, elections are of little consequence to us. We'll get through this. We'll get by that. And, and I, I think that's really to me, like the perfect um, manifestation of crisis competence is what I heard in that room that day. What would you say is the biggest misconception about older adults with HIV? I, I think it would be that, you know, they're somehow different. They're somehow a, a them versus an us. Um, I, I think really the the only thing that distinguishes older people with HIV from other older adults is that they have an HIV diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, really, out, outside of the HIV specifically, they are dealing with the same you know challenges and joys as as everybody else. Um, you know, we have this idea of I think still of HIV being a a disease of young people, um, particularly gay and bisexual men and white gay and bisexual men. Um, and we, we really don't grasp the diversity in the population of, of people with HIV. A lot of women, a lot of heterosexual men, uh, a lot of, of people of color, uh, people of diverse experiences around their sexuality. Um, but, but when you, you know, look at their daily lives, it's very much like everybody else's daily lives. You know, you you get up and uh, hopefully you have something to, to get you going for your day. And I, I think that may be the one one thing that might distinguish people is that a lot of older people with HIV, particularly long-term survivors, weren't able to work and have been out of the workforce for a long time. And now that they've survived... They really want to contribute back to society, but th we don't. We don't help them. We don't create those kinds of opportunities. Uh, you know, for example, somebody who's been on long-term disability, if they go back to work, they could lose all those benefits and actually be in a worse place than they were before. Uh, so I, I think one thing we could really work on is, 
you know, kind of creating opportunities and supporting people with HIV in their desire to give back. Uh, a lot of them talked to me about, um, you know, wanting to share their experience with HIV with people who are younger, or people who are newly diagnosed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's important, you know, having purpose and meaning in life is one of the things that, that keeps us going. It gives us a reason to get up in the morning. And um, it's especially, I think, really challenged now for everybody because um, everyone's life has kind of been turned upside down with the pandemic. Um, so that that I think would be something I'd like to see um, you know, researchers and program and policy people really focus on. And uh, so this, again, I think this is one of these issues that speaks to gerontology in general, because we're looking now at the baby boom generation retiring. We have people who have a lot of talent who want to keep contributing to society. So I, I think this is one of those things, if we could figure this out for older people with HIV, it would have some real positive implications for the field of gerontology as a whole. What would you say to new practitioners or researchers who are interested in, in the field of HIV and aging? Well, I one thing I would tell them is it's really it's really a frontier. If you're looking to get into an area of, of uh, practice or research um, where you have the opportunity to break new ground, I think it's certainly HIV and aging. Um, when I started doing this work in, in 2007, uh, HIV and aging was still kind of a little blip. And now, you know, it's there are a lot of people doing work in this area, which is really gratifying and encouraging to see. But we've just scratched the surface. Um, you know, I, I think people started doing serious research around HIV and aging probably in the mid-90s. So in, in terms of a specialty, this field is really at the beginning. And so it's it's a great opportunity uh, to do some trailblazing blazing work. And um, it's a population that certainly needs our uh, attention and support. Can you comment on any new findings that you see as groundbreaking, including as part of your own research that has a lot of potential for improving policies and treatment for older adults with HIV? I, I think there's some emerging work um, around the, the impact of aging in people who are with HIV, which is fairly new. Uh, but I, from what I've seen, um, there's, there's a suggestion, and, and we certainly need more work in this area, that because a lot of older people with HIV have, have kind of grown and developed with a serious chronic illness, uh, they may take a different attitude towards their aging than than other people. Uh, well, one of the concerns I have is there's a this theory around accelerated aging with people with HIV, and it's it's a theory, and there is some evidence for it, uh, but there's also evidence that doesn't support that. And you know, I mean, if you can imagine, if you have a life threatening illness and you think, oh, and now I'm aging faster than other people. Um, I, I guess I'm really concerned about that because mm -hmm. a lot of older people with HIV are internalizing this idea of accelerated aging. And we don't really know, you know, how valid that is as a theory. And, and my concern around that is if you look at the research around internalized ageism, uh, especially a lot of the work that Becky, Becca Levy did up at Yale, and how negative internalized ageism can be for your health. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I won't go all into her theory, but it it's, it's kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. Um, so I'm... I, I think this is an important area of work. I think we need to figure out more just how HIV really interacts with the aging process. Uh, and on the other side of it, I think we need to look at 
<clears throat> how things that we associate with aging impact living with HIV. So, you know, two of these things are very common in all older adults, is multimorbidity and then the polypharmacy that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you're talking about people with HIV who tend to have a lot of health comorbidities in addition to HIV. Um, you know, how is this going to affect them in terms of their own HIV treatment around staying engaged in care, staying adherent to their treatments, which is so important for long-term health and survival? Um, the other thing that's, that I think is emerging and we need to pay more attention to is, is now we're starting to get a fairly large cohort of older people with HIV who are age 65 and older. And mm -hmm. that wasn't true before. I mean, we've been, we've defined older people with HIV as people over the age of 50, which goes back to some historical definitions that were made by the CDC. But we're really now starting to see people enter early and, and sometimes later old age with HIV. And we have so little information about everything in that older cohort. So I, I really see that as probably one of the big growth areas uh, in research and practice in the next 10 or 15 years. Well, considering everything that we've talked about today, what is one last message that you'd like to leave our listeners with about HIV and aging? I, I would hope that, you know, the, this podcast and, I, you know, the, the interest group at GSA and all the work that you and I and a lot of our colleagues do is, is raising visibility about this population. People don't think of HIV and aging um, kind of in the same breath. Um, pardon me for mixing my metaphors, but um, I, I think it's, it's an important population that's often invisible due to not just the ageism in our society, but ageism in the world of HIV. And a lot of times when you have these invisible populations, uh, we don't really, as a society, do enough to support them. And so I, I hope we would all work to try and raise the visibility around people aging with HIV. And again, I, th I think that to the extent that we can kind of solve the problems and, and figure out ways to best support older people with HIV, I think a lot of those ideas can generalize to gerontology in general. Uh, you know, for example, uh, and, and, you know, with each subsequent generation, uh, fewer people have these kind of traditional nuclear families they can draw on for caregiving or have a child who's available to do that. And, you know, that's something that we've talked about in the context of HIV and queer aging, but that's increasingly the reality for other older adults because of smaller family sizes and children moving away to pursue career opportunities or for other reasons. Um, so, I, you know, I think that's just one example of an issue facing people with HIV that if we can do some better work there, that that's going to help older people in general. I think that's a very important thought and um, one that we need to think about more. Um, any other final comments? I I think that's about it. Um, <laughs> well, you've given very thoughtful um, comments and uh, and given us a lot to think about. And I just want to thank you so much for um, speaking with me today. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and let you know to join others who are interested in understanding HIV and older adults, please visit geron.org and sign up for the GSA interest group on HIV, AIDS, and older adults. Again, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me today. To learn more about the Gerontological Society of America, visit geron.org. The Gerontological Society of America was founded in 1945 to promote the scientific study of aging, cultivate excellence in interdisciplinary aging research, 
and education to advance innovations in practice and policy. For more information about GSA, visit geron.org.